Now, this movement of self-consciousness in relation to another self-consciousness has in this way been represented as the action of one self-consciousness. But this action of the one has itself the double significance of being both its own action and the action of the other as well. For the other is equally independent and self-contained, and there is nothing in it of which it is not itself the origin. The first does not have the object before it merely as it exists primarily for desire, but as something that has an independent existence of its own, which therefore it cannot utilize for its own purposes, if that object does not of its own accord do what the first does to it. Thus the movement is simply the, the double movement of the two self-consciousnesses. Each sees the other do the same as it does, each does itself what it demands of the other, and therefore also does what it does only insofar as the other does the same. Action by one side only would be useless, because what is to happen can only be brought about by both. In paragraph 182, we now have two self-consciousnesses which are confronting each other as such. They are confronting each other in a kind of reciprocity or mirroring that has, has reached the stage where it's no longer one confronting uh, an ambiguous other, although ambiguity, as we're going to see, still enters into this, this doubling effect that's taking place. Um, but now it's grasping that the other self-consciousness really is, as we say, an independent, self-contained thing like itself. And... You know, in the past uh, paragraphs at the, from the beginning of this portion of the section on, we've had this, this um, you know, what Hegel called an ambiguous supersession, you know, an ambiguous relation to the other. And the, the term that was used there was um, dopazinic, right? Zin means something like sense or meaning, um, significance. Here we have something that, that's being called a doubled meaning as well. There it's gedopled bedeutung, the, the, the significance of it. Um, the, you might say even the, the, the rendering, the translation of it, if we want to play a little fast and loose with um, translation ourselves there. And what's really important in this, in this passage is that now self-consciousness has worked its way through those ambiguities and it's arrived at a place where we're going to see greater ambiguities arising, or greater doublings arising. So he says, this movement of self-consciousness in relation to another self-consciousness has been, in this way, represented as the action of one self-consciousness. So if this is the self, this is the other, right? And then it realizes, oh, hey, I'm over there, um, it's the same as me, um, that means that I have to worry about it assuming the importance that I think that I have, better supersede it, better auf, you know, aufhebung uh, it uh, in, in the, the, however we want to translate aufhebung, transcend it, subordinate it would be another way that we could think about it that this was removed into the master-slave dialectic proper. In any case, I have to transcend it. And in doing so, then I realize that I'm also, because it contains myself, transcending myself. Um, now, it's no longer that, he says, um, but this action of the one has, ex has itself the double significance of being both its own action and the action of the other as well. So when I, when I um, what is the action that we're talking about here? It's the way in which we're taking a perspective on our relation to the other person and on the other person to us. This could take place in a multiplicity of modes. It could be action directly, where I, as we're going to see a little bit later, attack them. Or it could be um, action in the sense of a passion, and this sounds a little bit paradoxical, I know, where I feel something towards them, like anxiety, for example. Uh, it could be action in, in other senses as well. But in any case, it, we might think of it as taking a stance towards the other. Now, what, what Hegel says is that what, what's going on here is much more complicated. If I'm the I over here, I act towards the other, but the other act towards me at the same time and in the same way. The, my action is duplicated. As a matter of fact, I might not even be the first person to act. Perhaps this one acts first, and I'm the one 
who's mirroring. And I didn't even realize that I was doing that until I engaged in the action itself. I thought I was the one who was doing things first, and then I realized after a little introspection, no, they did it first. Usually this works out that way when we're trying to accuse somebody of doing something wrong, right? Uh, you you uh, transgressed first. But, he says it's the double significance of being both its own action and the action of the other as well. The other is equally independent and self-contained. Each self-consciousness is something that, at least at this point, appears to exist on its own. But yet they're also connected with each other. It says the first um, does not have the object before it merely as it exists primarily for desire. Both self-consciousnesses are, in fact, desire. But their relation to each other isn't one that can be totally subsumed within the realm of desire, precisely because what desire does, we saw this before in earlier sections of self-consciousness, is takes its object and consumes it. There's a dialectic of desire that leads to a replication of desire, right? As the desired object is taken in and thereby brought to nothing, made part of the, the ego, the self, the self-consciousness, the person. That's not quite possible in terms of this kind of object, self-consciousness, another self-consciousness. So he says, um, it's something that has independent existence of its own, which therefore it cannot utilize for its own purposes, if that object does not of its own accord do what the first does to it. So what we have going on here is, I'm going to put this in terms of I and, and other. I act, right? I see that same action being replicated by the other. It could be an act like gazing. It could be an act like smiling. It could be all sorts of things. And even within my act, I can't act unless the other is in some way contributing by their action to my very action. This larger action here, the, the, what we might say the explicit action, is indeed the same thing as this. And likewise, we can say this is the same as that. Oops. <laughs> Shouldn't be like that. Should be like this instead. There we go. Um, this is, in, on a macro level, what this is folded into this action, and, and vice versa. So. We've got a very complex structure being outlined here. He says, um, the movement is simply the double movement of the two self-consciousnesses. Each sees the other do the same as it does. Now, I've only uh, drawn these, you know, seeing, doing, and demands on, on one side. You could, you know, fill them in on the other side, but then our diagram would get much too complicated, so I wanted to keep it nice and simple. Each sees the other doing what it's doing. Right? So it's not just that I do something and somebody else imitates or replicates what I'm doing in relation to me. It's also that I see that happening. I witness it. I perhaps don't even see it necessarily in an ocular sense, but I imagine that it's going on as well. That's another possibility too. In any case, there's some sort of perception that the other is engaged in the same sort of activity as I myself am. What happens after that? It says, each does itself what it demands of the other. So, I demand some sort of action from the other. Look at me. Look at me. I'm here. Listen to me. I, want, I have something to say. In demanding that of the other, I'm expecting some sort of action from them, and I have to also in a kind of reciprocity, do that very action. If I'm going to tell you, look at me, because I'm a person, I have to treat you as a person already. It doesn't make any sense for me to tell the camera, hey, look at me, right? Because the camera does what it does. It's just a mechanism. The camera can't give me the same sort, you might say, of interaction or validation or reciprocity as another person does. And the only reason why, as I'm talking here in a nearly empty room to a camera, that I can, I can you know, sort of imagine that I'm doing that and be animated in my gestures is because I'm imagining another self-consciousness on the other side of that camera because I know that this is being used you know, for, for YouTube. 
in this case, right? Uh, or being preserved for posterity if I'm sitting, you know, recording something down the line. If it, if it was totally disconnected, if it was just a camera and, you know, pure mechanism, I, I wouldn't be able to have quite the same comportment towards it, would I? I have to assume that there's another being on the other side of it. So he says, Therefore, each does what it does only insofar as the other does the same. Now, does this mean, of course, that if I scratch my head, the other is scratching his head. You're witnessing me scratching my head. No, it's not about trivial gestures. It's about the things that are deciding what a person actually is. What we might call gestures or actions that have some sort of moral or metaphysical depth to them. Um, understanding those terms in very broad senses. So he says, action by one side would, would only would be useless because what is to happen can only be brought about by both. This is a good place to pause and think about the range of things that are really only possible as such when they are reciprocal. Now they can happen in somewhat degenerate or, or incomplete ways when one person does it. Think about, for example, unrequited love, right? We say unrequited when there's an action of loving on one side, and this action could be the feeling of love, it could be actions of love, choices, all sorts of things like that, establishing some common bond, wishing well to the other. There's lots of definitions of love. But then it doesn't happen in return. There is a kind of, there's a sense in which the one is, you know, blocked. It, it's not giving of itself the way that the other one is. That's a non-reciprocal action. Um, are there other actions where this reciprocity is going to be inherent to the nature of it? And we might think, uh, at least for those of us who, who are prone to bad temper, about the uh, effect of getting angry at a person and then getting angry at us in return for getting angry at us and then we argue about who got angry first and on and on and on. That would be a perfect example of the sort of thing that Hegel is describing here. This is probably something I need to write down after I get finished with this because I do so much work on, on anger. This actually fits it quite well. In any case, what, he, what he's talking about here is the moment where self-consciousness has become aware of each other as existing in relation to each other in this reciprocity, as independent, self-contained existences that now are facing off. Thus the action has a double significance not only because it is directed against itself as well as against the other, but also because it is indivisibly the action of one as well as of the other. Paragraph 183 is very short and actually doesn't require too much commentary. It's, it's a remark that is, in a sense, completing what was going on in paragraph um, 182 and is going to look ahead to what's going on in the much longer 184. So Hegel talks about, um, again, double significance. Here, in this case, it's the same thing that we were calling ambiguity a little bit earlier. So it's uh, doppelzinnig, right? Uh, it's ambiguous, it can be interpreted in two ways. And he says the action has a double significance. It has this ambiguity um, for two reasons. So the first ambiguity, or the, the first dimension of that ambiguity, is that the action is not only directed against the other, but is thereby, and that's how I've depicted this, directed against the self that is in, engaging in the action. And why would this be the case? Well, the other is an other self. It is a self-consciousness. It has the same sort of structure as I do. And here we're getting to something really important. The, the real ambiguity lies in the fact, as he says, that, um, let me read the passage as such, it is indivisibly the action of one as well as of the other. So without ceasing to be my action, it is also the action of the other. Now we can understand this in, in several different ways. We can understand this as the other is somehow in some way, you know, implicitly or co covertly um, contributing to my action or guiding it so that it doesn't just get directed against themselves. 
but also against myself, or perhaps, you know, that it, it, they direct it uh, so that it actually does go against themselves, rather than just against myself. There's other possibilities as well, and we're going to see these possibilities get played out in, in the, the future paragraph. So we, we have two different double significances going on here. There's a double significance that the action is, is essentially not split, but, but it has two different aspects. It's, it's direct against the other, but also against myself at the same time. And the other is engaging in the same kind of action, or the other is provoking that kind of action, or however else, what other mode we want to see the other taking, you might say, some ownership over that action. In this movement, we see repeated the process which presented itself as the play of forces, but repeated now in consciousness. What in that process was for us is true here of the extremes themselves. The middle term is self-consciousness, which splits into the extremes, and each extreme is this exchanging of its own determinateness and an absolute transition into the opposite. Although as consciousness it does indeed come out of itself, yet, though out of itself, it is at the same time kept back within itself. It is for itself, and the self outside it is for it. It is aware that it at once is and is not another consciousness, and equally that this other is for itself only when it supersedes itself as being for itself, and it is for itself only in the being for self of the other. Each is for the other the middle term through which each mediates itself with itself and unites with itself, and each is for itself and for the other an immediate being on its own account, which at the same time is such only through this mediation. They recognize themselves as mutually recognizing one another. Paragraph 184 is continuing to explore what we might call the contours or the structure of the reciprocal relation with the other self-consciousness. Interestingly, you want to keep in mind too, while we're exploring what that is for us, the other self-consciousness is doing exactly the same thing in return by virtue of the fact that they are another self-consciousness. And that's going to come out a bit more in this section, in this paragraph, than it did in the previous paragraphs. So Hegel starts out by, by saying that there's an interesting analogy here, um, a sort of mirroring of, of structure. We saw earlier with the play of forces in force in the understanding, you know, forces would, would you know, solicit each other, and the one who's, who's, you know, soliciting is being solicited to solicit. There's a very complex interplay, as it turns out. And an interplay not only about agency, about activity and, and you know, soliciting, um, but also about, you know, being in itself and for itself, all these other, uh, other determinations. So Hegel is saying that there's an analogy or a, a similarity of structure. There, there's an analog here to self-consciousness in its doubled form. And it's necessarily doubled form, by the way. Like we said before, you do not have a self-consciousness that is not already connected with another self-consciousness. It just doesn't work that way for self-consciousness. So then he's going to go on and he's going to say, Self-consciousness itself is the middle term, and we're, we're getting to the language that he likes to employ about syllogisms, right? Uh, you know, he Hegelian syllogisms are not the same thing as Aristotelian syllogisms, whatever you may think, you, you know, about Aristotelian syllogisms, which are actually scholastic ones. Aristotle had a much broader way of talking about it. Be that as it may, what's important here is that self-consciousness itself becomes a middle or mediating term, and we're going to see how that plays itself out when it splits itself, as he says, into the two selves, the, the two consciousnesses. And the reason why I put a, a dividing line here, or something almost like a division sign, instead of just, you know, the dash, is because he starts playing back and forth a bit with, with these terms. Um, and, and, you know, it's a a lexical way of symbolizing something that's going on in this paragraph and also through the rest of it, which is that consciousness is trying to figure out what the hell it is, what, what that self is, 
and the self is at the same time bound up with the consciousness of the other. This is almost starting to sound a little bit like Lacan, and if that's the case, that's because Lacan is actually drawing quite a bit on what's in Hegel at this point. Uh, let's not get too deep into, you know, interpretation, though. Let's, let's stick with the text. So he says, um, the middle term is self-consciousness, which splits into the extremes, and each extreme is this exchanging of its own determinateness and an absolute transition into the opposite. So the same thing is happening on both sides of this, this splitting, this doubling. There is a determinateness that is taking place, and also a movement towards, motivated by desire, as we've seen, towards the other. It's exchanging its own determinateness and an absolute transition into the opposite. What's the opposite? You know, being something other than what has been determined to be. So he says, although as consciousness it does indeed come out of itself, yet, though out of itself, it is at the same time kept back within itself. Okay, that happened, we saw, with the interplay of forces, right? A force that comes out of itself into the phenomena that it, it's, it's trying to express that it is acting upon, that it is acting through, it comes out of itself, it comes out of the sort of inner resources, and yet at the same time, it's kept back within itself something of that, otherwise it would not remain a force, it would just be the individual instances that we see, right? So he goes on and he says, this is happening for self-consciousness. It is for itself, it has this relationship of uh, being able to take a stance upon itself, that's what makes it self-consciousness, right? It has to be for itself, or it's not self-consciousness. And that happens on both sides. Both of them are for themselves. And then he says, and the self outside of it is for it. What is the self outside of it? Well, here's where it gets interesting. We could say two different things. The self outside of it is a sort of externalization of itself, which is also for it. When I go through these moments where I, I feel that I am not just, say, my costume, and I realize that yet at the same time I am my costume, this is starting to sound more sartre isn't it? Um, that would be what Hegel is describing. There's another self outside of it as well, though, right? The self of the other. The self of the other self-consciousness. And that is for it as well. So each is not only for itself, it is also for an other. And it is equally for an other as it is for itself. You don't get, here's, here's how Hegel might be saying this at this point, you don't get to define precisely what you are only in your own terms. You're doing it in part through the mediation of the other. So he says, um, it is aware at once that it is and is not another consciousness. I, I am this, but I am also this over here, even though I don't feel from that person's perspective or see the world from their perspective, what happens though when I am listening to another's story and I'm imagining what it is to, to see the world through their eyes or to feel as they do? How am I able to do that at all if I can't in a certain sense be where the other is? What about things where it's involving what, you know, Augustine, for example, said, look, you know, when it comes to uh, certain things, we can't enjoy the same good. If I put my hand on a beautiful body, you can't put your hand there until I move it as well. But when it comes to thought, knowledge, wisdom, if I understand the Pythagorean theorem, which, by the way, is, you know, the go-to for all sorts of you know, examples like this, but it has a certain beauty to it, right? A certain attractiveness to it, a certain intelligibility. If I understand it, and then I convey that understanding to you, have I lost anything in the process? Have I taken away some of my, you know, storehouse of that and given it to you? No, you now have the same thing, and it becomes yours just as much as mine, and it's because it, it's really neither one of us that owns it. It is something that transcends both of us in, in, in that way. And when it comes to self-consciousness and its relation to the other, it works that way as well. So he's saying um, th this uh, 
It, it, it at once is and is not another consciousness. Equally, this other is for itself only when it supersedes itself as being for itself. And it is for itself only in the being for self of the other. Now, that's a complex thing that he just said. I've actually got it drawn here so that when a self-consciousness, technically it should be over there on the other side, right? But when a self-consciousness supersedes its own being for self, it, it overcomes that, it transcends it, it incorporates it, and it now grasps its being for the other as the other is for itself. Let me read this passage one more time. It is for itself only in the being for self of the other. It grasps itself no longer from its own perspective, but from the perspective of the other. But notice here, not simply as an object for the other, but as the other is grasping its own self. What's the difference here? Something very important is going on when we, when we think about this. When I can see myself not only as an object in the other's eyes, but as another self, the way that the other understands what it means to be a self, what it means to be a conscious human being, I gain a different perspective upon myself, don't I? That might be something negative. But it might also be something very positive. Think about the encounters where we have a certain self-understanding, so there's, a, there's a, uh, a reflexivity there. I am just this guy who does this sort of thing. And then we see ourselves from the perspective of the other who's not just looking at, at us as an object, say, something to exploit, something to make do something, but rather in terms of their own self-relation, in terms of how they understand what it means to be a person, to be a human being. And let's say they have a more expansive concept of that, that, that unlocks human potential or even recognizes human potential more. My supersession of myself in that case, my own perspective, means moving to a better perspective. It could also be a worse perspective, right? If I have a rich, you know, inner reflexive life and then I'm forced into the confines of a bureaucratic mentality that barely understands itself, let alone what it is to be another human being, that could be a, a real loss as well. But this is inherent in the nature of self-consciousness as a dynamic, Hegel thinks. So he says, here's where we come back to self-consciousness as the middle term. Each is, for the other, that middle term. Each of them is self-consciousness, the mediating term, for the other self-consciousness. Whether you realize it or not, whether you're in the higher or lower spot on the power dynamic, whether you came before or came after, you are a mediating term for another self-consciousness. This doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be all, all great. There's many ways of mediating that aren't so great as we're going to see in the master-slave dialectic. So he goes on and he says, um, through which each mediates itself with itself and unites with itself, and each is for itself and for the other an immediate being on its own account, which at the same time is such only through this mediation. Where Hegel is going to conclude with this is saying, we might, we want to be kind of cheeky, he recognizes that recognition is mutual recognition. That this process of honor canon, uh, you know, uh, of recognizing the, the other as, as a person is self-recognition. That's part of the mutual and also gegen, you know, there's this opposition of uh, uh, function going on. So you might say, like I put here, recognition is mutual recognition of recognizing, of recognizing that the other is engaged in the process of recognition 
and expecting or demanding the same thing from us. We are all mediating terms for each other is, is what Hegel has expressed here. 